you get your training, you get your practice, you develop your skills, and then the day comes when you're on your first big one. You approach that building and your brain is saying, don't do this, don't go in there, this building's really dangerous. So you come up to the threshold and you're at a point where you get to take the, that step and your brain is saying, bad idea. But once you go over that threshold, you get this calm. It's kind of in a weird way, it's like somebody flips a switch. This roaring, burning fire, tremendous heat. You happen to be the nozzle man. They tap you on the shoulder and they say, go. And you open up the line and you go. Montgomery County, Maryland, 1966. For the Carter family, fighting fire is in the blood. Like firefighting families all over the world, they have passed the tradition from generation to generation. Firefighting was a steady diet at our house. We had, we had firefighting with just about every meal. <laughs> I was always the little one of the bunch, and I always followed John and all his friends, and Dad worked a lot during the week. He was always at the firehouse because he was always an officer and eventually a chief and things, so on weekends is when we really looked forward to it because Dad would, you know, do things with us, and then he'd always take us down to the firehouse. We'd always watch the guys slide the pole and say, gosh, when we're old enough, we're going down there. We're going to be a volunteer. We're going to make that difference. We're going to be riding that back step of that fire engine. The Carter brothers started volunteering at the local firehouse. But being volunteers wasn't enough for Jim or John. Like their father, they wanted to make firefighting a full-time job. Both brothers chose to join the fire department in Washington, D.C., the big city, where they would be certain to get the big fires. They thrived there. In October of 97, John made sergeant. When John got promoted to sergeant, it's like a light came on. And he was so into his job. I mean, he called me every day. I can't believe so-and-so, he's a great truck driver, or so-and-so is a great wagon driver, or this guy can really fight a fire good. This guy, I feel good riding behind me. And he enjoyed going to work, and I was proud of him, I'll tell you. Friday, October 24th, is a day that I'll never forget. The morning was very unusual. I, in 14 years of being married to John, never got up with him before he went to work. It was so odd, I just, I jumped out of bed that morning. And I even walked him out to his truck. And I had never done that in 14 years. And I gave him a big bear hug and I kept kissing him and told him that I didn't want him to go to work that day. October 24th, remember that date. It's one the Carter family will never forget. October 24th, Washington, D.C. Sergeant John Carter gets to engine 14 in the early morning to relieve the officer on duty. Two miles away at engine 22, another officer, Lieutenant Ken Crosswhite, waits for his replacement. I was waiting to get home. It was the end of my shift. Um, I'd come downstairs. I was sitting downstairs with the fellows. And we got a call for an investigation of smoking area. You know, thought it was an everyday routine call. Got halfway there. Um, our communications division called and said, be advised, we're going to fill out the box which means they have a report of a working fire. A working fire is a confirmed fire that's still burning. Engine 22 was the first to arrive at a small grocery store on the corner of 4th and Kennedy Streets in Northwest Washington, D.C. Sergeant John Carter is four minutes behind in engine 14. 
soon as we crested the hill, and I said, I don't think we're going to go home on time this morning because you could see the smoke in the street. And uh, we knew we had a working fire, but it looked like our everyday, normal fire that we go to hundreds of times. The presence of fuel, oxygen, and heat causes the fire to burn intensely. But it seems safe enough for Lieutenant Crosswhite and his buddies to mount an interior attack. Went inside, smoke was probably chest level. We hit the fire, fire darkened down, we thought that was it. All of a sudden, it was like someone went and uh, turned on a light switch, turned it on and off. That's how quick things, conditions got really bad quick. Um, visibility went to zero. The heat was like someone hitting you in the head with a sledgehammer and knocked you to your knees. Reporting from Northwest Washington, shortly after 6 a.m. this morning, a fire broke out on the corner of 4th and Kennedy Streets Northwest. Washington, D.C. firefighters are currently fighting the blaze at a neighborhood grocery store. October 24th, Washington, D.C. A routine fire in a corner grocery burns hot and hard. Inside, Lieutenant Crosswhite and his crew come face to face with the fire. Minutes later, Sergeant John Carter and his team also enter the store. Literally, you can't see your hand in front of your face. My ankles were burning, my shoulders were burning. Uh, you just couldn't see. The only thing you had to rely on was your hose line getting out. Your hose line is pretty much your lifeline. It's your one way in and one way out. If you follow the hose, it's going to take you to the fire. And when we were on our hands and knees, the floor tiles had started popping. And I told the guys the fire was underneath of us. I remember there was beer cans and stuff in the store. They were exploding. And at that time, I made the decision that it was time to back out. I told them to drop back about five to 10 feet and we'll start pulling the hose back. But let's do it slowly. I said, hold on to the shutoff and I would hold on to the tip. That way I knew I would be the last person out because my number one responsibility was to get these guys out. And we went outside and as soon as we got outside, a firefighter from engine 14 came up and said, my sergeant's not with me. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean your sergeant's not with you? He says, my sergeant's not here. I said, who's your sergeant? He told me, Sergeant Carter. It's every firefighter's worst nightmare to have a buddy lost inside a fire. Firefighters depend heavily upon each other. If you're down, you need your buddies to come in and get you out. If they're down, you need to go in there and get them out. Much like Marines, you don't leave yours behind. They're not going to die for a building. They're going to die for a furniture store. They're going to die for a buddy. They'll help a buddy out. Washington, D.C.'s firefighters discover that one of their own, Sergeant John Carter, is missing inside a burning grocery store. It's shock, denial, it's feeling overwhelmed, it's, it's mentally confused because the person may have been a, a half a step behind you, you could feel them behind you, you could sometimes sense that they're there or you know that they or they were touching your coat. And then when they don't come out, it, it is absolutely terrifying. You just don't want to believe that you actually have one of your own firefighters lost in a building. I was hoping that he was in a corner somewhere. I wanted to get to him and, and get him out. Crosswhite goes back inside to attempt a search and rescue, but the conditions in the store make it impossible. I remember I was holding on to the wall. I was listening for just a groan or his breathing apparatus, but I, I was unable to hear anything. My feet were, were falling through the floor and the, uh, 
The people at the doorway were yelling, get out, get out, it's messed up. The fire is in the basement. It has turned the first floor's floor into a minefield. A team of experienced firefighters tries to contact Carter on his radio, but he doesn't answer. I could imagine what was going through his mind, thinking in the back of his head that the other firefighters were coming to get, get him out because it's one of the things that you rely on is your brotherhood, that these guys are gonna come and get you no matter what. Out on the street, the firefighters refuse to believe that Carter is lost. They argue with incident command for permission to go back into the building, but now even the roof is in flames. Time felt like it was standing still, and time was of essence at that point to get Sergeant Carter out. John Carter is alone in the fire. His air supply is good for no more than 30 minutes. The longer his rescuers are forced to wait, the smaller their chances of finding him alive. One hour and 45 minutes after John Carter disappeared, firefighters found his body in the basement of the grocery store on the corner of 4th and Kennedy Streets Northwest in Washington, D.C. I have found nothing in my entire history that is worse than losing one of your own in the line of duty. Um, the emotional, uh, impact is profound and it's one from which some people may never recover. Jimmy Carter gets the news. His brother John has died in a fire. It was a big shock to me. I wandered around the firehouse a little bit, and, I, and naturally the thoughts started going through my head, well, how am I going to call mom and dad? I think I ought to. Then the nightmare began. It was, it was a tough day. For the firefighters, it's like they lost a brother. Even for the ones that did not know John and that came from a different county to the funeral, they all stood there with tears in their eyes and they felt that they lost a brother that day. This was the most devastating thing that has ever happened to my husband. He said, I have to stay strong for Debbie and Brian, which is what he did. He held up great for the weekend. And after the services, then it was, I can't believe I've lost my son. And of course, then his words were, why wasn't it me? He was my buddy. We always, we always talked. Have it anymore. <laughs> Firefighters understand that they may have to make an ultimate sacrifice at some point in the career. Not all of them will, but they certainly understand that. In fact, I think that most of them have that in the back of their mind. There's a little bubble up there that says, you could die doing this. You might not come home to your family tonight. And you kind of in your consciousness say, yeah, I know. And you put it aside, and you got a job to do, and you just got to go do it. 